All right, so I want to talk about the second type of bonding theory for covalent bonds. The first was valence bond theory, and now we're going to talk about MO, or molecular orbital theory, which has a similar idea as valence bond theory, because we're still talking about overlapping orbitals causing this shared pair of electrons, but it also helps to explain other characteristics about these particular compounds. And the key to molecular orbital theory comes from the wave nature of electrons. Remember that electrons can be both waves and particles. It's that wave-particle duality idea that, that they act like a particle, they have mass, they take up some amount of space. I mean, it's a teeny tiny amount of both mass and volume, but they also have this wave nature. So electrons can be visualized as waves, and that's sort of what these atomic orbitals are, are a visual representation of the wave nature. So if we have overlapping orbitals, these orbitals are coming together and interfering with each other, then we're not just really talking about balloons like we've kind of been talking about these shapes that come together, but now we're talking about waves that are coming together and interfering with each other. And if we have waves that are interfering, then they can interfere in two ways, constructively or destructively. Constructive interference means that we're building up, we're constructing something. So if we have one wave that's here, here's my wave, and if I have another wave that's in the same position, overlapping it, that's here, then my resulting wave from these things, when I put the two of them together, is going to be something that looks larger, larger than either one of the two. Okay, so they interfered with each other constructively. They got larger when they interfered with each other, right? Now you could calculate this mathematically. We're not going to. This is sort of a qualitative way of understanding this. This constructive interference means that it's larger in scale. Um, this could mean a positive thing if we're talking about energy, greater energy. It could be a negative thing also, <clears throat> depending on which way. The other way that waves can interfere is destructively. So if I put a wave together, here's one, with another wave of the same magnitude that is out of sync, right? So if I have a wave that's going this way, say, now I have these two waves that are coming together out of sync, and then when I put them together, it's just going to be a straight line. They destructively interfered with each other and washed each other out. You can see this with ocean waves, even, that the waves will build up together and then they have a large swell, or that waves will hit into each other out of phase, out of sync, and that will cause flatness on the surface. Okay, so if we're thinking about this as orbitals and electrons, then we can have this either a constructive interference, which is a good thing, right? This is a positive thing, and destructive interference, which is a negative thing, and let's talk about why that is. In valence bond theory, we said that when we bring together two orbitals, let's say we have two 1s orbitals, when we bring these two guys together, the overlap is the bond. So we bring them together, and now we have these overlapping orbitals, and this is the bond between them. And we're saying something similar with molecular orbital theory, but now we're saying it's a little more complicated than that. If you bring together two atomic orbitals, yes, they could overlap and have some sort of positive interaction, but they could also do this destructive interaction as well. And so there isn't always going to be a favorable overlap. It's all about whether or not this overlap is good or bad, whether it causes bonding or whether it doesn't cause bonding. So we kind of have these two options when we bring together these orbitals.
if we have constructive interference, even though we have a larger peak here, this still represents um, more of where the electrons are located. So there's a favorable interaction. So when we're thinking about um, whether or not this peak is large or small, then this is a good thing because it's larger. There's a larger probability of where the electrons should be and energetically speaking, that's favorable or destructive where the electrons are in a different position and they're in a position that makes them energetically unfavorable. And I wanna to try to represent that with some drawings here because it's kind of a tricky concept to get down. So if we have constructive interference, then this is when bonding will occur. So this is a good thing. And if we're visualizing this like our orbitals, if this is my nucleus, and then here's my overlapping orbitals, again, kind of in alignment with valence bond theory, this overlap here represents where the electrons are actually located. Okay, so the overlap is where the electrons are, and these electrons are located between the nuclei, which we know are positively charged. Nuclei are made out of protons and neutrons, so the net charge of nucleus is positive, and the electrons like to feel or like to be between two positive charges. This is energetically an ideal position for them because of the attraction to both. Okay, so this would be the ideal bonding situation for the wave nature of electrons if we're kind of visualizing it this way. Now, if these orbitals interact destructively, then we call these anti-bonding. Anti-bonding because it's not a favorable position energetically speaking. Now again, you could get into a lot of detail on this and put math to it, but at this general chemistry level, we're just going to talk about this in terms of um, kind of qualitative ideas and just as a model for how and why covalent bonds occur. So if we're thinking about this destructively, if it's a good thing for the electrons to be in the center, right? And the electrons have a probability of being anywhere within this atomic orbital, right? There's a higher probability that they'll be closer to the nucleus and a probability they'll be in some sort of shape around it, depending on the orbital, the orbital type, S, P, D, or F, okay? If we're just thinking about these S orbitals, this is the most positive position for these electrons to be in, in between these two positively charged nuclei. So the opposite must be true for kind of the least energetically favorable. And the opposite between both electrons being in between two nuclei is for each electron to be on these outer sides of the nucleus. So we'd end up with our nucleus here, it's kind of positively charged, and our electrons out here somewhere. Right. So if we're kind of visualizing our orbital, it sort of looks like this. Here's my positively charged nucleus for this one. Here's my orbital here. Here's my electron, right? So instead of having electron density in the center here, the way that these waves have interacted because electrons are waves is that we've canceled each other out. So the way that that's represented with our orbitals is by putting them on opposite ends, complete opposite ends. So there's no, this one is feeling the pull of this nucleus and this one is filling the pull of this nucleus, which is positive for them, for each individual electron, but it doesn't mean that there's gonna be great bonding occurring. And the reason for that is because this nucleus is looking at this nucleus, right? And so we have two positive charges here, and this is a bad thing because we have repulsion due to these like charges. Now, if we have repulsion here, this is energetically unfavorable. So this is very high energy situation, much higher energy than this sharing up above. So if we're comparing the two, this is lower energy. Atoms like to form bonds. We get energy when we put things together and form bonds and we it takes energy to break them apart because it's such a favorable thing, right? So if we have this situation where we have this anti-bonding occurring, this repulsion causes this phase, 
this destructive phase to be higher energy than if a bond was to occur. Is everyone with me so far? If we think about this in terms of an energy diagram, which we've talked a lot about with our atomic orbitals, it kind of looks like an orbital diagram. If we have energy that's increasing along the Y here, if these are hydrogen atoms, let's put our S orbitals in there. So we have hydrogen atoms that have a one S here. Here's my H and here's another one, right? I'm gonna compare the energy of both. These are both one S orbitals. They're both gonna be at the exact same energy level, right? Because they're both for hydrogen. So they're both the exact same. So we're looking at the same thing. And now based on molecular orbital theory, it says if we bring these two orbitals in, then we create two options. We create a lower energy option, which is bonding because of constructive interference. And we create a higher energy option because of destructive interference. And because these are sigma bonds, right? If we're talking about the same uh, definitions that we had before, sigma meaning along the axis, pi meaning our overlapping p orbitals, then this would be a sigma orbital. And this would be what is called a sigma star. And the star indicates that it is an antibonding orbital. So it's antibonding, which means that it's higher energy. That star here, it's kind of muddy, looks like this, right? It's just an asterisk. And this here, this sigma orbital here is my bonding. Now again, note the energies. If we have just one S orbitals, they're at a specific energy. It's a lower energy configuration to share those electrons between the nucleus, right? It's lower than either one individually. So energetically speaking, it's favorable for them to want to make this happen, to want to make this um, bond happen, right? Lower energy is what we're always striving for. We want the lowest energy possible. We have to put energy in, in order to get those electrons to go into these antibonding orbitals. It's higher energy because of this repulsion that occurs between these exposed nuclei. So if I put my electrons in my orbital diagram here, here's one here, here's one here. Then when I put them into the center, this is my two together. So this would be H2 if I'm showing the bond between is in this middle column here, then this electron is gonna go here. This electron is gonna go here, right? Spin up and spin down because that's the way they have to occupy that, it's Hun's rule. So when we look at these things here, then I'm out of electrons. I have two electrons that are in this lowest energy bonding orbital and here we go. And that's all there is, right? So this is my molecular orbital diagram and we usually see it like this, MO diagram. And we can get information about what type of bond will form based on where the electrons are located in this MO diagram. And this has to do with something called bond order. <coughs> I love this paper because it reminds me of clothes I had in the 80s. Not that you guys would remember such things, but there you go. So bond order. Bond order is a number that just tells you how many covalent bonds are gonna form. So if you end up with a, and I'll give you the equation in here in a second, if you have a bond order of one, then that's a single covalent bond. If you have a bond order of two, then it's a double bond. And if you have a bond order of three, it's a triple bond. And here's how you calculate the bond order. Bond order is calculated by taking the number of electrons that are in bonding orbitals, let's call that N sub B, So that's the number of electrons that are in the orbitals that are lowest energy, right? So not the starred orbitals. And you subtract from that the number of electrons that are in antibonding orbitals. So 
So remember, this is lower energy. This is a good thing. The electrons in bonding orbitals are going to cause bonds to happen. The electrons in antibonding orbitals are going to impact those two atoms' ability to make bonds. So we have to take away all the bad stuff from the good stuff to figure out whether or not these bonds will form. Okay, so we take the difference between those two, and then we take half, or just divide by two. So when we take half of this difference, then that gives us the bond order. If we take our hydrogen example, which I'll try to put this up here, So here's our hydrogen example. If we're looking for H2, then we take one half the number of electrons in bonding orbitals, which there's only the two that are in this bonding orbital up here. We subtract from that the number of electrons that are in antibonding orbitals, which in this case is zero. And so one half of two is equal to one, which means that a single bond will form between my hydrogens. Oops. That's an E, single bond. Okay, so the bond order tells me how many bonds will form because again, these bonding models are telling me why covalent bonds form between particular atoms and why they don't between others. So let's look at an example where a bond does not occur. This is gonna help with some of your sapling assignment as well. So let's look at the same type of energy diagram but now with helium. So helium, we know, has two electrons each, right? It's number two on the periodic table. So those two electrons are in my 1s orbital. So I have a 1s orbital for this helium and a 1s for this one. Now when I put these two 1s orbitals together, I have two options, right? Regardless of whatever it is, there's two options when I put together these 1s. I have either a bonding or a sigma orbital, right, where the overlap is energetically favorable, or I have an antibonding where the overlap is destructive, it is unfavorable, so we have this sigma star antibonding, okay? This is going to be hypothetically He2. Now you should be saying to yourself at this point, I know that helium is not going to make a diatomic molecule, right? Helium is one of our noble gases. I know that it doesn't form a diatomic. So that's what we're going to show here. We're going to show why that is. So if we put our electrons into our energy diagram here, we have two in the 1s on this helium, two in the 1s on this one. So if we're thinking about this in terms of columns, here's my helium, here's my second helium, and then here's the two of them together. So if I bring in one electron from this one and one electron from this one and put them into my bonding, because I have four electrons to work with, and then I bring one electron from this one and one electron from this one and put them into my antibonding, okay? Then now we're working from this, and if I plug this in to my bond order equation here, I'm looking at the number of electrons in bonding orbitals versus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals. So that would be, if I'm going to do bond order, that's one half, two, two electrons in my bonding orbital here, minus two in my antibonding orbital. Two minus two is zero, one half of zero is zero. So that means that the bond order is zero, which means no bond forms. Okay, so molecular orbital theory helps to define and give us reasons for why bonds form or don't. And again, that's sort of the name of the game with these theories. Okay. So this molecular orbital theory is really all about predicting these bond orders. It will also help you to explain magnetic properties, and your book goes through oxygens, which I think is really useful. Um, you can tell if something is paramagnetic or diamagnetic based on these things, but I'm not going to get into a lot of detail of that here. I just wanted to show you how it's done, what bond order is, and how it relates to the theories and covalent bonding that we've been talking about. So that's it.